Good morning, everyone, both live and online. It's my pleasure to open the second day of our conference and my great pleasure to announce our keynote lecturer for today, Professor Thomas Zeman from the University of Vienna Faculty of Law, a renowned legal historian, a longtime friend of our faculty, who will be giving a lecture on the medieval roots of penal law in Western Europe. Professor Zeman, the floor Thanks. is yours. Maybe I go to the, well, the PowerPoint presentation. It's better to go to the computer. Sit here. Thanks. So thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, it's really very nice for me to give this lecture because you mentioned it. There are many points which are uh, connecting me with this place since long. And um, so it was very nice for me to come here. And um, besides that, uh, yesterday, um, I can follow to uh, many points which were discussed yesterday. So it is very interesting to continue with this discussion by my lecture, my contribution. Um, I will read uh, because my English is not uh, good enough to speak freely. Um, in my lecture, I want to go back to the roots of penal law in Western Europe, to the roots of the penal law of our days. Maybe I should precise the subjects as it formulated in the program. So at first, some remarks about the term Panel law. What I'm speaking about using the term panel law. I'm going to speak now about a type of norm which threatens a corporal punishment, first of all, the, the different kinds of capital punishment. I will not speak about the physical the details of these penalties. What I'm more concerned with here are the norms which threat capital punishment. When does this type of norm appear in the sources? Of course, capital punishment, we heard that yesterday, was a self-evident part of the ancient legal culture. Yesterday, we got a very strong impression of the penal law of the ancient world. However, it seems that the tradition of ancient, of ancient penal law, as many aspects of the ancient legal culture too, was interrupted in the so-called dark centuries between antiquity and early middle age. Since the recurrence of capital punishment in the course of the Middle Ages obviously was independent from the ancient legal culture. No uh, continuity. Uh, yesterday we heard it from the first keynote lecture. To reconstruct this recurrence and the further development of penal law, we have to go back to the Middle Ages, namely to the centuries of the High Middle Age. That is 12th and 13th century. Before the High Middle Age, penal law seemingly didn't have that importance as it had at the end of the Middle Age or in early modern period. At least, we find it only very sparsely 
in the written sources. So my lecture will have two parts. At first, we will go, we will have a look on the rare sources of the early Middle Age. What role does criminal law play here? In the second, a bigger part of my presentation, I will move to the high Middle Age to give an impression of the social and political context in which penal law arose. Penal law as defined, as uh, just defined. Norms which uh, are menacing, which uh, have um, corporal punishment as a legal consequence. So at first a look back to the early Middle Age. However, the problem concerning the early Middle Age before 11th century, there are very less written sources from which we could infer something about legal practices of that time. But surprisingly, the tradition of sources is better concerning the 8th century and the centuries before, since in the period of the very early Middle Age, the aftermath of the high developed scriptural tradition of the antiquity is still noticeable. It is the time of those Teutonic reigns, which were founded in the transition period between late antiquity and very early Middle Age on the ruins of the Roman Empire, founded by different Teutonic tribes as the Ostrogoth and later the Langobardic in Italy, the Visigotorum, and most important for the medieval history of Western and Central Europe, the Frakes whose empire became the foundation of the Holy Roman Empire. Inspired by the example of the Roman imperatories in their role as legislators, the kings of these Teutonic reigns tried to emulate the Roman emperors and initiated the recording of the law which was practiced by their respective Teutonic people. This way, the so-called Legis Barbarorum, very famous as a source, um, emerged. The Legis are very special sources indeed, since they give us some insights in a legal culture which otherwise was purely oral. The legis are the result of a process of partial acculturation, something like acculturation, of the Teutonic oral non-literal tribal culture to the high developed civilization of the Roman Empire. On a very low level, Abraham, on a very low level, the Teutonic tribes overtook some basic elements of the Roman legal culture. First of all, the idea of written law or the idea of legislation. But also single Roman legal institutions are to be found in this legis. So the legis in no way conclude pure Teutonic customary law, but it's to say that the influence of the Roman legal culture differs. The earlier one among the legis show a stronger Roman influence, the earlier one like uh, the Lex Visigotorum, for example, show a stronger Roman influence than the later one. 
they give us an impression of a, so to say, primitive legal culture. I mean, a pure oral legal culture. And especially important for the question of my lecture, they give us an insight how violence within the society was sanctioned. So I would like to start with a few on two of these legis barbaroro, namely the so-called lex ribuaria and the so-called pactus alamanorum. The one is a record of the tribal law of the Greeks, because the ripuaria, they, they are a part actually of the, of the Frankish, of the, of, I don't know how to, to pronounce it, Franks or Franks? Franks actually, yes. Um, it's a Frankish, uh, it's also a Frankish tribe, this ripuaria, uh, but, um, something like, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, it's a, it's a, a part of the Frankish tribe. Uh, they, they had a special uh, place for settling um, beside the lower river Rhine and the uh, river Mosel. And the second force will be the Pactus Alamanoro. Um, the Alemanni um, settled in the, uh, they invaded in the Roman Empire in the fourth century and settled in the nowadays uh, German speaking Switzerland, Southwest Germany, and in the nowadays um, Alsace. Um, Lex Repuaria, a record of the tribal of the Franks and the other is including recorded tribal customary law of the Alemanni. Both leges are comparable young, 8th, 9th century, so Roman influence is weaker compared with elder leges like Lex Visicotoro. The Lex Ripuaria even concludes a number of terms in old German language. It's a mixture. They are written basically in a vulgar Latin, you know, uh, Latin, written Latin on a very low level, primitive, so to say, and but enriched um, with a big number of Teutonic or early German legal terms. So it's also a very interesting source uh, for philology, uh, old German philology. Um, both texts, anyway, can give us an impression of a society without penal law, or expressed more precisely, a society where capital punishment seemed to be an exceptional, exceptional phenomenon at least as free people are concerned. Free people, beside unfree peasants, who had a status at that time similar to slaves. Very often this term is used in the uh, legis. To become more concrete, I want to have a few on those norms written down in the legis, which are regulating the legal consequences of killing and wounding of theft and defamation. So we could have a look. Um, the both sources. And um, now it's, it's in German, but it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's about killing. It's, um, rules about the legal consequences of killing. And if you see, um, it's gradated between the, it's gradated, it's um, between the developing or yes, developing from the 
tribe which is concerned by this uh, act. If a uh, repuaria, because it's uh, Lix repuaria, um, killed an immigrated Frank, he must pay 200 shilling is the currency which is used here. But of course, um, this payment um, 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 happened in uh, happened by um, more often by cattle, but um, in the source itself appears something like a currency. If a repuaria killed an immigrated Burgundy, or a Burgunder, settling in, in the nowadays Burgundy as a part of Southeast France. Um, he has only to pay 80 shilling. So you have a difference depending from the, the tribe. If a repuaria is killing a man from the own tribe, the panel it's not a panel, but the sum which is to pay is higher than killing, than in the case he killed a member of another tribe. More, cheaper, so to say, is a member of the old Roman inhabitants which remained in this um, parts of the former Roman Empire when the um, Franks invaded this part of the Roman Empire. Big part of the Roman population uh, migrated, uh, went away, but um, a certain layer remained. And you see, there is a significant uh, difference between members of a German, of a Teutonic tribe and Roman, Romans. Um, number four, other uh, German tribes are um, uh, uh, mentioned here, Alemanni, Friesen, Bavarian, Saxon, it's uh, always 80 shilling because they are not Franks, they are other uh, Teutonic tribe, but it is a Teutonic tribe. So you, you have this gradation. Um, Interesting is the sum, the money um, which has to be paid for killing a clerk. It's surprising, the sum is surprising low. Background of that is that in this very early, in this period of the migration of the Teutonic tribes, um, the layer of the clergymen, of the clerks, um, this, this was regularly Roman, of course, because the, 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 uh, the Teutonic tribes only in the course of the time uh, got Christian. So a clerk, a free clerk, regularly is a Roman. Uh, man, so the sum is low. Um, this is from the Pactus Alamanorum. Um, um, concerning acts, concerning wounding another person. You see, you see, it's an extremely detailed regulation. 
for example, you know, if someone is wounding here, the sick one, the woman, uh, it's 12 shilling, and then you have this difference if he is paralyzed, only paralyzed, or he is cut, and then every finger, you know, is mentioned dif dif uh, differentiation between uh, paralyzing and you know, cutting very detailed. You see, um, this very detailed regulation shows us the importance of this type of criminality, killing and wounding. And so, um, you know, the whole body is um, um, is mentioned. You see, also at the end of this um, rules concerning wounding, um, in differentiation uh, res respect uh, in in respect to the estate of the damaged person um, wounding a slave slavery is still alive because this is a, 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 was an element of the roman culture which uh, remained alive when the teutonic came um, there is a significant difference uh, between um, two uh, between wounding a slave and wounding a free Teuton. This is um, obvious. And the same goes for Leeton. Lite is, is not a slave. Um, it is an unfree peasant. So, to come to resume, to come to resume, Crimes, including crimes which are from a modern perspective, have to be qualified as capital offenses and not sanctioned by capital punishment or any corporal punishment. Actually, they are not sanctioned by any penalty at all. This goes at least if we speak about penalties in a modern sense, that means a sanction which is imposed by an institution, a ruler or later the state, which is not directly damaged by the crime. By the crime. In accordance to that, our sources don't use the term pöna. Instead of pöna, the term compositio is used. Compositio. In the cases of killed men, the old German, so to say, polyphonic synonym was Wehrgeld. Wehrgeld was the compositio which had to, to, to be paid uh, in the case of killing a man. Wehrgeld, this is such a mixture between Latin and Teutonic language, um, because Wehr is, a, how to say, uh, is, a, is a corrupted um, Wehr, is a corrupted Wehr, you know, and um, this is the money which has to be paid for killing a Wehr, a man. Compositio or Wehrgeld. Obviously, the compositio or the Wehrgeld is not the same like a penalty in the modern sense, which is to be paid to the state or in pre modern time at the keeper of the jurisdiction. In contrast to that, the composition, the, comp the compositio, was paid to the victim or better to the victim's clan, respectively. 
concerning the functions of these compositiones, we may assume two functions. Um, the main function was the satisfaction of the victim's clan. Besides that, surely it had the function of compensation. Maybe if we look for a modern institution, which is more or less similar, it's problematic such a comparison, but um, that compositio, maybe we could find an equivalent in the so-called punitive damage of the American problem. But back now to our question concerning corporal penalties. In contrast to the early modern period, when corporal punishment was a regular punishment of every serious crime, in the Legis Barbarorum, anyway, in the case of the Lex Repuaria and the Pactus Alamanorum, capital punishment and even any other kind of corporal punishment seem not to be of any importance. At least this kind of punishment isn't mentioned anywhere in this kind of source. So, one of the most discussed problems in medieval legal history in Germany has been the question, which conclusion can be made from that result? Does it mean that capital punishment was completely unknown in the very early Middle Age? I want to mention three points which are especially discussed concerning this question. First point, the rules of the legis regularly are referred on free people. But what about unfree people, unfree peasants? We must not forget that the social layer of unfree persons was very wide, especially in the early Middle Ages. There are some sources, admittedly very less, which are reporting us that a lord has killed one of his tenants, of his serfs, who had a status at that time similar to slaves. Um, killed, he killed his serf, the sources are reporting because, because of obedience. Following, um, on from, following this, some take the view that one origin of corporal penalty could be found in the relationship between landowners and their serfs. However, this thesis is rather speculative, since there are only very less sources. And these very less sources do not reveal the context of this killing, of this act done by the by this potence. So we don't know if there was such a thing, if there was at all such a thing as a procedure. The sources only are telling us that the, that the Lord, a Lord, a potence, as the powerful Lords are named in this early medieval sources, has killed his serf. But this seems to be very much more similar to a spontaneous act of revenge than to a legal procedure with the purpose to decide about the punishment. The same goes for some cases which happened, following the sources, in the circumcircle of the Franconian kings of the 7th century. Some sources tell us, indeed, 
that the king himself personally killed a person because of felony. But also in these cases, the question arises, was there such a thing like a procedure or was it a spontaneous act of revenge? At last, at, at, at last um, a third intensively discussed question, what about the so-called Moor bodies? Bodies which were found in the moors, the swamps of northern Germany and southern Scandinavia. Obviously, these people didn't die a natural death. Rather, they died by execution. This is rather uh, clearly to see. This was like that. So the question arises, where, again, where they condemned to death at the end of a procedure? And if there was some such a thing like a procedure, given the case, what were these persons found guilty of? Following to these more bodies, some present the thesis that capital punishment must have existed among the Teuton, the Teutonic tribes. Some suppose mostly in cases of sacred crimes, sacred crimes. But To sum up, at least in the written sources from very early Middle Ages, corporal punishment seemingly had no or at most a marginal importance. So I want to change now to a later period, namely the high, the high Middle Age, first of all, 13th century period from which, from which significantly more sources have survived. In this time, something like a cultural evolution took place in Western Europe, or not only in Western Europe, in Europe in general, a cultural revolution bringing back a secular written culture to Europe. The rise of a new jurisprudence began, as well known. On the base of a comparatively dense tradition of sources, we are able to identify three points in the social system, which can be estimated as starting points in the development of a penal law, as it was typical for the early modern period. A penal law with capital and corporal penalties on the base of the Inquisition procedure, as it was typical for early modern period. I'm starting with um, most important root of penal law, the canon law of the Western Church. Without any doubt, the most important root, just because we find here, canon law, the origins of a scholarly jurisprudence of penal law. And besides that, also a point of basic importance, the church 
developed the so-called Inquisition procedure. I just mentioned it. Inquisition procedure, which can be estimated as a prototype of the modern criminal procedure. The latter modern criminal procedure is nothing but a reformed Inquisition procedure. So the Catholic Church has been a decisive factor for the development of penal law. The starting point of the canon penal law had been the so-called don't know if uh, yeah the, the, the starting point had been the so-called libri penitentiali a tradition starting already in the early Middle Ages. These libri penitentiali usually included a table of the sins and violations of ecclesiastical rules, like the observance of Lent and of the ban of work at Sunday and holidays and so on. The libri penitentiali also included the sanctions which should be imposed in the event of a violation of the ecclesiastical rules. Originally, this had been specific ecclesiastical sanctions like long-term fasting or exclusion from the ecclesiastical service, duty to pilgrimage, and so on. But, and we shouldn't go too deep into detail here, two points are crucial here. The prosecution of violations of biblical and of biblical or biblical, biblical and ecclesiastical rules didn't depend from the initiation of a procedure by accusation of a damaged um, person. By, by accusation from the sight of a damaged person. So, instead of this, the responsible ecclesiastical institutions initiated the procedure ex officio. It, it didn't depend from the initiation of a procedure from the sight of the damaged person by accusatio. And in the course of the time, the church developed the famous principle, ne crimina remaniant impunita. No crime may remain unpunished because every unpunished crime is an immediate act of disobedience to God, who is the creator of all these rules. He would get angry if violations of his orders remain unpunished. And an angry God, seen from the perspective of the medieval man, was the absolutely worst case which could happen to the mankind, since an angry God, an angry Yahweh, as it is, is named in the Old Testament, an angry Yahweh would punish the whole man by his terrible penalties as plagues, pests, you know, famine, wars, the, by the, the famous, you know, um, catastrophes which um, came to the world. Um, in the course of the high middle ages, first of all in the 13th century, the church intensified the prosecution. This happened at two points. First, the prosecution of crimes committed by clerks. Second, and much more important, for the spread of corporal punishment, the prosecution of heretics. It was especially the latter 
which went together with the expansion of capital punishment since the crime of heresy was estimated to be the most serious crime against Christian faith. Since the 13th century, this kind of criminality, crimes against faith and ecclesiastical dogma, spread rapidly in Europe, long before Protestant Reformation, long before. First of all, the so-called Tatar, or also named Albigenza in southern France and Catalonia, and the so-called Valdenza, named after the leader of this movement, Petrus Wald Valdes. They gathered, uh, they were concentrated, this Valdenza, in the Western Alps, Savoyan lands around. Both Katara and Valdenza have been a mass phenomenon. In the Balkans, the Bogumilen challenged the church. All these movements, all these movements questioned the authority of the Catholic Church in a basic and a very dangerous matter. So heresy became a mass delict, which spread thorough Europe and together with it, the spread of capital punishment, namely the execution by burning, which got the usual form of execution in all cases concerning Christian faith and ecclesiastical dogma. The authority of Catholic Church, of the Catholic Church, was seriously menaced. So the Church started an extremely cruel and bloody crusade against the Albigenza, the Katara, in uh, Catalonia and, you know, this whole uh, southern France, which is the uh, Languedoc and uh, this part of France and Provence. The crusade against the Katara and the Valdenza, and this went together with a huge number of procedures procedures basing on the principles of inquisition procedure, which has been developed in this period. Inquisition procedure, it means in contrast to the traditional, I mentioned it, to the traditional purely oral procedure. The inquisition procedure took place exclusively in a written form, basing on a file. And it, besides that, I mentioned it, Initiation ex officio is very important, not longer depending from the accusatio of the damaged person, and very important, the torture as an integrated uh, element of, um, of uh, this inquisition procedure. Concerning the execution of death penalties imposed by ecclesiastical courts, something like a division of labor between ecclesiastical and secular powers emerged. Ecclesiastical courts were only responsible for carrying out the procedures <clears throat> and the judgment of the cases, but the execution was an affair of the secular authorities since um, the Church was bound to this famous motto, yeah, me, Ecclesia non sitit sanguinem. That means the church is not thirsty for blood. So, you know, this bloody part of the procedure, the execution, um, is an affair of secular powers. The ecclesiastical root of penal law is especially important since the beginning of a jurisprudence penal law mainly took place in the bosom of the church. Penal law as a science, or, or better, as a kind of prudence, jurisprudentia, at first was a part of canon law. They developed, for example, these whole general principles like 
uh, this term guilt was treated in canon law register guilt you know uh, voluntary uh, this difference for voluntary and fallacy you know all these basic terms were developed uh, in the canon law literature of the high middle ages starting the high middle ages but we have to leave now the ecclesiastical sphere and to change to the secular one. Um, beside the church, it had been, it have been the cities, at first the cities of northern Italy, which developed a penal law with a corporal punishment. I'm speaking about the urban statutory law. Whereas the church fought heresy, the cities tried to repress violence. We must take into consideration here the following. Violence was a self-evident component of the medieval culture. You can say it's not um, very different today, yes, but there are huge differences indeed. This fact was densely connected with another basic element of medieval legal order. In the Middle Ages, it was self-evident that everybody has to protect his rights himself. This went at least for all free men who were able and were allowed to carry weapons and to fight. Persons who were not able to fight or not allowed to carry weapons needed a protector to enforce their rights. The latter mainly affected the Jews, but all the clerks, of course, the women, the clerks, at least monks, yeah, and of course, women. What I'm speaking here about is the fact that the legal culture of the Middle Ages was deeply influenced by the idea, by the idea of German Selbsthilfe, English maybe self-redress. Is it a, a good expression? Self-redress, yeah, the idea of self-redress. Self-redress took place in the way of fighting. The contemporary term for such fighting for the enforcement of the own rights was fede, feud. Feud is something like a private war against an opponent who is blamed by another to have violated his rights. The feuds had to be declared and announced in a formal manner. However, in the course of the later Middle Age, the institution of the feud more and more became a problem. Very early, this was the case in Northern Italy. Since about the 13th century, the powerful, and economically high developed cities of northern Italy tried to repress the practice of the feud, at least in the space within the walls which surrounded the medieval cities. The counteract, to counteract violent management of conflicts within the cities, the community started to make statutes outlawing self redress that way. These bands were motivated, not last, to institute and enforce such a thing like internal security, securitas publica, at least within the walls. Step by step, the violent management of conflicts gradually was forbidden. Such prohibitions more and more were connected with threatening of capital punishment. Admittedly, for long, admittedly, 
for long perpetrators still could avoid inquisition procedure and capital punishment by payment of a sum of money. The so the, the, in the early Middle Ages, compositio negotiated between the perpetrator and the victim or the family uh, or the clan of the, 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 the victim's clan. So two, you know, two ways of conflict management, so to say. But nevertheless, a first step in the direction of a general ban of violent management of conflicts was done. I want to move now to the last point, the, co the so-called movement of peace, which had a similar aim like the urban statutes mentioned, namely the ban of violence by threatening of corporal punishment, including capital punishment. To push through this ban on the countryside was very much difficult than in the cities. The space within the city walls could be controlled very much better than the white space on the countryside. And besides that, in the high middle age, the big cities of Italy had already the characteristics of states. That means they had an apparatus of offices and they had already, even already something, such a thing like a police in the sense of armed forces for internal deployment. And not to forget, they had an intensive legislation producing the urban statutory law that way. All this didn't exist on the countryside. The territorial states north of the Alps didn't develop before the end of the Middle Ages. Therefore, we will not find there a statutory law like in the big Italian communities. This is the same uh, it's to say um, that um, those for Flandern, the, um, the cities in Flandern, nowadays, so Belgium, is um, they're also high developed, and uh, you could find there yeah, this the same situation like in. But nevertheless, also on the countryside, there are, there are considerable attempts to fight violent management of conflicts. But these efforts were not carried by a state, as mentioned states in a modern sense didn't exist in Europe. In, in general Europe before the end of the Middle Ages. More there they are carried by powerful noblemen and princes of the Holy Roman Empire, and not to forget by the church. Later, the medieval uh, emperors had an important role. I'm speaking now about the so-called peace movement. How does this movement run? This movement was basing on agreements between the noblemen of a certain district, including the promise to set aside all use of violence and to accept the ban of feud, at least within the respective district and for a certain time. The contemporary German term for these agreements was Gottesfrieden or Landfrieden, yeah, the sources. Um, Troiga Dei, Troiga Dei, Truth of God, is, um, could be the translation, Peace of the Land, Pax Dei. At first, these agreements mentioned, these agreements mentioned, were initiated and mediated by the church, therefore, Pax Dei. 
namely by the bishop of the respective area. Later, the emperor got more important in this respect. To institute such a Pax Dei or Landfrieden, the, feudal, the, the, feudal, the feudal lords of a certain district were convened either by a bishop or later by the emperor to negotiate an appropriate agreement which must be assured then by all those who were prepared to consent. Oh, yes, no. but I will finish now. Obviously, the land freedom couldn't be put through just by a statute. There were valid only for those willing to swear and willing to submit to the rules of the land freedom. Beside the land freedom, regularly, besides that, the land freedom regularly were temporary and must be renewed after some years. First, such bans of youths and use of violence were exceptional. They were valid only for exactly defined areas and periods, and they had a binding effect only for those who had been prepared to submit under the rules of the tax and to take an oath of it. For example, feud ban at certain times, mostly end of the week, holidays, fasting periods, feud bans for certain places, churches, mills, and so on. The crucial point for our question here is the fact that the rules of the Pax were connected with corp corporal penalties, even capital punishment, for the case of a violation of one of the rules by somebody who took an oath of it, who, had, who has uh, uh, taken an oath of it. And as important, capital punishment should be executed anyway, regardless of the fact that the perpetrator has settled an arrangement with the victim's clan, being prepared to pay a fine to it as a wehrgeld. This was um, independent, you know, from a private arrangement. Uh, the, um, this kind of punishment. In the course of the later Middle Age, the bans of youths and other violent management of conflicts were extended. That means the times when beauty was forbidden were extended. This way, the bans of violence and feuding were gradually were generalized. In this way, the scope of capital and corporal punishment also was more and more extended. Um, however, this process of extending capital punishment and other forms of corporal punishment proceeded in a different way. It proceeded um, a different quick, depending from the estate of the perpetrator, um, but also, of course, depending from the type of delict concerned. The process of, um, yes, um, I maybe I um, I come to end now because I think it's it's better to I think yes it's eleven o'clock it's one hour I think it's enough. Um, the um, the crucial point is this process of extending, you know. Um, of this um, Landfrieden and by, by this way um, the, the rising importance of the capital punishment um, on the other hand it's to emphasize that the transfer from private satisfaction by payment to public Corporate punishment, capital punishment, went faster in the case of 
clandestine acts, as theft, and it lasted longer in all cases of killing and wounding in an open fight, so to say, an honorable fight between two honorable fighters. This was especially true for noblemen. Um, but um, it's also to emphasize that for long in Northern Germany, even until 16th century, 16th century, capital punishment and private arrangement between perpetrator and victim existed side by side. You, you find both practices. And it's uh, the, the last remaining, you know, um, the last remains of this, um, of this um, private arrangement, so to say, between, between perpetrator and victim's clan or the victim themselves, vanished not before the 16th century, at least in, northern, uh, in, in, in the northern parts of the Holy Roman Empire. So this process went differently quick, uh, um, developing um, from the, uh, the area we are speaking about. So it was a very long uh, journey. <laughs> Uh, I have to um, thank for your attention and now we can try to deepen some aspects or some point which remained unclear in my lecture. Um, Thank you very much, Professor Zeman. Are there any questions? Go on, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Zeman, for that uh, wonderful lecture. I was struck, I suppose, first a comment and then a question on the, the Fumittelalter German law codes, um, the similarities that can be found, for example, on the far side of the continent in somewhere like Ireland, where pre-English, um, what we call Brehen law codes, which are insular, um, have an almost identical setup of compensation payments, again, usually made in cattle. Um, what's most interesting there, um, and I've, I, might, I might have misheard you, but I was curious to know, so for example, in Ireland, it's, it's largely a mono-ethnic society, so there's no there's nothing in the law codes differentiating between, say, Irish and non-Irish people. No. So, but from what I understood in Germany, obviously, they're differentiating between the Franks, the Romans, and the Burgundians, I think it was. Could you say a little bit more about uh, the sort of class distinction? Because what we do see in those Irish law codes, which are first kind of uh, well, first organized, perhaps in an oral sense, and probably written down in maybe the 7th, 8th, ninth century in Ireland, there's a very um, sophisticated distinction on social class from slaves right up to kings. And also the second question then, if you'll permit me, was I wonder could you, I, I realize you might not be able to say for sure, but could, could you explain what you meant by the potential for those who were executed in that early German Teutonic system, those people found in, in the box or sorry, in the forests of North Germany, you, you, you suggested that there may have been sort of a, a, a sacred offense. Uh, is that to mean somebody who is offending against religious norms of the time? Or might it perhaps be something like regicide? Would, could that potentially come on? Uh, uh, regicide, the killing of a king or, or of somebody sort of anointed by God or felt to be Maybe maybe the Teuton leaders aren't anointed by God in the same way that people are in the, the high Middle Ages or the later Middle Ages, but I was just curious to know what might that offence perhaps have been. I realise you may not have an answer, but I'm curious to hear your musings nonetheless. Um, so, yeah, the problem is um, this lack of um, sources, of written sources, um, 
uh, especially um, concerning these bodies, because um, um, they uh, um, were found um, in, a, in a space which was outside the Roman Empire, which never was a part in the Roman Empire, so this could be pure Teutonic, so to say, not influenced by um, the Roman legal culture, but um, you can make legal history in this space and at this time more or less only on an archaeological base. <laughs> not, um, and so you can only guess. Um, um, some try, you know, this famous, uh, there's this exception of this famous source from Tacitus, you know, about the Teutons, the Teutonic tribes, Tacitus, but, um, you know, this is a very problematical source. And but Tacitus is mentioning, uh, indeed, um, mentioning, um, Tacitus is writing about um, capital punishment at the uh, Teutons. He is mentioning that in his report. And he is connecting it with um, sacred crime, crimes, uh, felony against the tribe as a whole. Um, so maybe it's to suppose that crimes which are in a special way menacing the tribe as a whole, like um, sacred relics which make the, the gods angry, so they are a danger for the tribe as a whole, or um, yes, felony of the tribe as a whole. Um, one could understand this report of Tacitus in this direction, but this is not really, uh, you know, this is not a, a serious space of, uh, of source for sources and for theories. So um, the, the focus of this very early legal history, especially of the, uh, um, of the, um, Teutonics outside of the Roman Empire is um, concentrated on archaeological research. Yes, and and um, the differentiation between um, you um, uh, predominant is this differentiation uh, between the tribes, obviously. Um, very important the differentiation between the Roman layer of the population and uh, uh, the Teutonics, um, but uh, there is also this differentiation um, um, between social layers, so to say, unfree and free uh, uh, persons. The, um, the status of unfree uh, persons also it was not um, always the same, you have different grades of um, dependent people, so to say, Leten were half free, the so-called so Lites, um, but it's recognized that this differentiation got stronger in the course of the, of the late mid-age. In, in, in these sources, um, um, it is um, not so differentiated like, for example, in the source of the Saxon Spiegel, which is a source of the 13th century. There is a more uh, gradated, is a more gradated um, um, differentiation uh, between the different social, uh, especially between the different um, kinds of unfree or only partial free uh, peasants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, it's uh, good that we started with this early pe period. So my question, in fact, it is more, uh, I think, a comment, is on the role of Catholic Church uh, in uh, this uh, process of forming um, um, criminal uh, law and criminal punishment. Um, you, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, they um, started this prosec uh, prosecution ex officio, and uh, then you mentioned few Latin sentences uh, uh, that they used, uh, like rules for that. So I would um, also add um, another one, and it is uh, crimina, uh, omnia crimina publica esse, uh, uh, um, and um, uh, it is a connection with, in fact, because uh, uh, canon law was very much connected also with Roman law. And so it's uh, very important because this sentence served to, um, to separate criminal law or, um, or delicta publica from delicta privata because they were not in favor of uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, private persons to um, to um, um, initiate a procedure and to um, you know to have that punishment in favor of them, and so uh, at that point uh, there was a differentiation between criminal law on the other hand and uh, for these private delicts another. Another, um, so, uh, sorry, um, another idea on, or concept of restitutia. So, uh, you know, this, uh, this big concept of restitution. And so then we have the, uh, the source of this modern uh, division of criminal law on the one uh, hand and of pri uh, private law. Uh, uh, Sorry. This, um, this, yeah, this is more. Yes. I'm. Um, it is more common, and of course, yeah. I would like if you can uh, also add your comment on that. So yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Um, the uh, the introduction of the ex officio principle. In the, um, in the law of procedure, um, as it was done by the, by the church, is densely connected with this idea every crime is an uh, offense of public interest, independent from um, the question uh, whether um, is it only one individual person which is damaged, or is is it is the, the city uh, or the community uh, as a whole? Um, the idea behind is also um, individual damages, uh, crimes which which, um, which are causing individual damages are. Uh, a question of public interest, because every crime, completely independent uh, from the, from the question who is uh, who is damaged, is against the public interest. Is against the idea because it is an um, offence of the idea of securitas publica. And this idea, securitas publica, um, um, arose or appeared in the course uh, of the High Middle Age, when these cities, these communities, at first in northern Italy, but more or less at the same time in, in the southern Netherlands, nowadays southern Netherlands, got something like small states and connected with this process is the idea within 
the borderlines of this state, um, there is only one um, uh, institution which is allowed to use violence, namely the state itself, and nobody other. And therefore, you have then the, the idea um, every crime is a kind of violence and must be prosecuted by the um, community. So this. If I may add just briefly there, I know we're close to the time for the break, uh, but uh, since you spoke about the period when uh, the state imposed punishments regardless of any potential deal regarding compensation with the victim or the victim's family, uh, are there perhaps uh, data about the reaction of the community, particularly when the such deals became not just ignored but illegal. So when the state took over the entire right to punish and instigated strict criminal procedures, because it always seems to me that it must have felt like an injustice to the people who were used to getting a compensation for the crimes and now no longer did. It was felt as um, indeed there was such a reaction. Um, this goes at first for the nobility. The nobility um, estimated this as a as an you know offense of an old right that a nobleman is allowed to fight for his right and um, that he is not forced to go to the court. He can go to the court. What's typical for this time was actually that most, uh, that the, conf that the, the conflict, um, the both sides of the conflict, they typically, they changed more or less between feud and court. They uh, usually, they um, went on two lanes, so to say, but they could, if they want, they could go back to feud. And um, even in the 16th century, we found cases in, in, in the Holy Roman Empire, yeah, that noblemen say, uh, no, no prince has a right um, to uh, forbid feuds for me. I'm a free nobleman, so, um this is not uh, this cannot be uh, justice that that such a prince is uh, uh, forbid me the, my my right of fighting this was more this aspect um this uh, this aspect which uh, made resistance among the nobility and um um maybe Maybe this is more important, was more important than um, than this aspect that he uh, got, that he could lose uh, compensation because his right um, in this moment when this ex officio procedure, the inquisition procedure, you know, you have this separation of a civil procedure and a penal procedure, and um, you could. Um, further on, um, um, raise an action for, uh, for compensation. This was not, um, this didn't vanish by, by uh, uh, there was only the separation of procedures. Thank you very much. If there are no more questions, so, thank you once again. Thank you. coffee break and then we'll be back in 15 minutes. <laughs>